Welcome to Learning Photography with Duck. Here's your host, Duck. All right, here we go. <laughs> we are we are live. <laughs> we are live and on the air. And uh, one more time, uh, my name is Duck. This is Learn Photography with Duck. Thank you once again for joining me on a Monday evening. Uh, I know with the warmer weather being here, there's probably a lot better things that you would rather do than listen to me talk. So I really appreciate it. I really, really do, guys. Today is our... Uh, oops. Too many buns. There we go. It's Monday. It is Monday. Today is our photo Q&A, but I, I figure I put a little bit of something together for you because uh, from my understanding, based on some non-scientific feedback you guys really appreciate some of the little tidbits that i put out uh at the beginning of the show uh alan's here brian's here bill bob on his ipad jill's here carol sent me a message she won't be attending she's got other things to do hopefully we'll get a few other people um uh you guys uh do me a favor don't be stingy share this experience with your friends. Let others know that we're, we hold these meetings on a Monday night. I'm sure you know plenty of people that can uh, use some of the lessons that are learned here. Uh, please invite them to join. Okay, the more the merrier. All right. Hey, hey Doc, are we allowed to give out the... Uh, Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, there's no password to this, so it's whoever wants to join in can join in. So, <clears throat> so to, uh, oh, before I, I forget, considering I updated this, uh, we have uh, coming up, I'm going to be doing, once again, getting back into our, our annual multiplicity photo shoot. This year, we're going to be doing it at Southford Falls. Any of you who have ever been to Southford Falls understands the beauty of that place. It is a gorgeous place to bring your camera to. If you've never been to, I highly suggest you take a ride out there. Uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, there's hiking trails, obviously, uh, but... <clears throat> Just around the entrance alone, there's a lot of photogenic areas. There is, of course, the waterfalls that the falls are named after. There is a little stream that runs down, and then there's a little covered bridge that goes over that stream. There's um, picnic areas. There's a little uh, um, stone gazebo. There's some lawns. There's a little pond. All kinds of great stuff. Uh, you can definitely spend a day, you know, shooting around there. Uh, so we're going to be holding our, uh, I should do a count. I think it's our 11th annual, 10th annual, 11th annual uh, multiplicity photo shoot. And what that is, is we will break up into groups of two. You'll be working with a partner. Your partner is going to be using your camera to get pictures of you creating a scene in front of your camera. Or basically what you're going to be doing is it's an advanced version of a selfie, but you'll have help in, in you know helping you compose your image. It's up to you to decide how you want to create the selfie. And what you're going to be doing is taking multiple photos of yourself within the scene interacting with yourself and then we'll bring all the images into photoshop put them all together to create one image with this you know hopefully a nice little scene uh um, playing out where you are the only actor in that scene it is a lot of fun you do get to learn a lot of things uh, uh not only about composition uh, but but working in uh, creating a composition little bits at a time you know so it's a great skill to have even if you're not shooting multiplicity shots 
uh, I use the same techniques a lot of times, even with my own product photography. Uh, just recently, I had a, a uh, client of mine saying, hey, I need a group shot of these four items coupled along with four controllers, all right, as a group shot. The only problem was I only had one controller. So I had to place that controller within the scene at four, the four different spaces to go along with the four other items that were in the scene. So understanding how to uh, stage a, a scene where you're going to be working with missing items that get added in later, uh, understanding how spatial relationships work and things like that. It's a good skill to have. Uh, so if you're into, you know, product photography like I am, or if you're into still life photography, uh, it's a great skill to have. And of course, if you do any kind of portraiture, it's a great little uh, selling uh, gimmick that you can sell to your clients or to your friends or, or you know, your family where you know, you place them into several positions. I've done this with my grandson, where he's literally on the couch all over the place on the couch, and he had a blast doing it. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's a great way to get your kids involved in photography as well. Anyhow, that is on uh, Saturday, June 26th. Uh, we're going to meet at Southford Falls at 10 o'clock. And we're just going to go until whenever. That following Monday, it's an off night for my normal Learn Photography with Duck uh, sessions. So I will be scheduling a very special one where I walk through how to combine all the images that you got from the workshop using Photoshop. So uh, if you attend the workshop on Saturday, Hopefully you'll join in on Monday and I'll walk you. It's a very, you will be surprised how simple it really is. All right. Uh, and then we'll assemble it all together. So hopefully you'll join me. Uh, it's free to go. Just I ask that you sign up on the events page on Learn Photography with, with Duck. All right. That said, let us get into uh, tonight's show. I'm going to do a short little presentation. Uh, and then after that, I'll open it up to Q&A. Okay. So let me share. I'm going to share a slide presentation, window projector. Is this it? Share. All right. And we're going to go to desktop hopefully okay everybody see this okay understanding past masters yes okay awesome yes oops somebody's phone okay so yes. what i've done is i've pasted a link into the chat window uh that refers back to an article i wrote as you can see from the date back in 2015 uh, where I actually go into a little bit more detail on, on uh, understanding what past painting masters, the techniques that they used to really engage the audience with. So today what I want to talk about is one particular, well, actually it's several styles of uh, painting and photography and filmmaking that share very similar principles, all right? And that is uh, tenebrism, chiaroscuro, noir, and what we normally refer to in photography as low-key photography. You've probably have heard some of these terms you've definitely probably you've definitely heard chiaroscuro it's a, uh, a very common term that gets tossed around in photography and i'm sure you've definitely heard of low-key photography 
And if you're a film buff, you've probably heard, heard of film noir. The one that you may not be overly familiar with is tenebrism, and I'll explain what that is. But they are all very similarly related. Now, the reason I, I am doing this today is because I recently did a portrait of my two grandkids. Uh, Doc, your, your picture is, is covering oh, the text. Oh, yes, it is. Thank you. Uh, I recently did a... Uh, uh, a photo shoot with my grandkids and I created this little portrait uh, to give to their mom for Mother's Day. And of course, I made a copy for my wife since she's the grandmother. Uh, and everybody loved it. And I ended up making a whole bunch of other prints to share throughout the family. But it got me thinking about, uh, you know, this technique that is very simple. Uh, on the outset, but can be very complex in, in actuality to pull off because there's a lot of little tricks that you need to understand. But I just want to give you an overall understanding of the principle. And as you can see here, uh, the, the common core of all of these is the use of light to direct the eye to the more important parts of your image. The flip side to that is the dark areas, all right, the underexposed areas, are used to kind of hide the less important things uh, and to put some of the uh, some sections of the image into a little bit of ambiguity. The key important role, uh, the uh, important parts for this, though, is the contrast between the light and the dark areas of the image. And how you balance that ratio of, of light and shadow kind of gives a, a little of information about the volume of the space. Uh, um, and so you can use it to kind of re reduce the volume, all right, or to kind of uh, give a sense of what the volume, you know, making making a small space seem more expanse because of that ambiguity of darkness. The first uh, term is the one that you're probably not familiar with, which is tenebrism. Tenebrism and chiaroscuro are often used interchangeably without the person really realizing it. Or I would even argue that people use the term chiaroscuro when they're actually describing tenebrism because they are very, very similar as to their look. They both use high contrast uh, light and shadow. It's just the quality of the shadow is a little bit different. All right, you've, uh, if anybody has ever seen uh, the Netflix uh, uh, series uh, Stranger Things, you might recognize this scene um, where she goes into this kind of like other world where it's, it's just pitch black. And the only things that are illuminated are the key essential things for the story. In this case, it's the main character and the task that she is, un, you know, undertaking in the search through this other world. Uh, but the one thing you're going to notice is there is absolutely no detail in that shadow area. Everything behind the characters is completely black. And this is one of the, the uh, aesthetics, I guess you can call it, uh, one of the key elements that describes tenebrism. Tenebrism has a starker use of black fields in their image, uh, whereas chiaroscuro is a little less. Okay, so this tile of typically painting, 
utilizes specially pronounced chiaroscuro, all right? Chiaroscuro meaning uh, darkness, where there is a violent, not my, not my words, uh, I took this from Wikipedia, a violent contrast, meaning it's very extreme. And you can see it here. There is an extreme uh, difference between the light and the black. If we were to look at past masters, uh, especially the Dutch painters from around the um, 17th century, they were well versed in this kind of lighting technique. Uh, this one here in particular called The Matchmaker uh, by uh, Garrett Van Hornthorst. Uh, this is the image that I use in that article that I linked in the chat. And in that particular article, actually it's two parts, uh, I go into a lot of detail about the composition of this image and the use of uh, visual symbolism uh, to describe certain things that are happening within the image that isn't quite obvious. Uh, for example, uh, the lute during this time was representative of sexuality. Uh, it was kind of like uh, a, a hidden message, all right, indicating that, hey, you know, there's a, a little sexual tension going on here. Now, obviously, over the decades, over the centuries, a lot of the symboliz symbolism has uh, lost its meaning. You know, now we just look at it as a musical instrument. We don't understand the symbolism that they had back then. However, if we were to have put a half-peeled banana in her hand with a sly look on her face, you would very easily understand that message. All right. So, uh, uh, that particular article goes a little bit into symbolism as well as the chiaroscuro uh, and tenebrism uh, technique uh, that the painter utilized. Uh, and in particular, how every element in this uh, image um, plays an important role. So, for example, if we look at this character here. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, let me get my, there we go. Can I draw? Yes, I can. Oh, there we go. All right, this particular person here, his gaze is at the main character. This person here, this gaze is at the main character. All right, so there's a lot of leading lines coming in uh, just by the placement of the characters. And of course, you know, the light itself just illuminating this whole area. Oh, I keep doing that. All right. Our eye immediately goes to that central character. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to get a lot into uh, compositional techniques Today, I just want to basically introduce you to Tenebrism, Chiaroscuro, Film Noir, and uh, uh, Low-Key, and, and have you understand that those principles, okay? Uh, this is another one, all right? If you notice in the background here, there is almost no detail. We see a little bit of foliage from a tree. Uh, and we see a little bit of highlights on what uh, is assumed to be maybe a little stream there, okay? Otherwise, literally, all right, this whole half right here is black. Half the image is in black, all right? And our composition is centered right here in the rule of thirds, okay? And you can see also that, you know, we have kind of like this, this 
line of action that comes up to the brightest point, uh, which is the angel over uh, St. Francis. All right. Uh, we see a lot of light down in this area. Okay. But it's not the brightest area. The brightest area is up here. Okay. And this just kind of pulls the eye up. All right. But <clears throat> I want you to pay attention to how so much black just kind of isolates the main subjects. All right. Here's another one where there's a little bit more light on our main subjects, but the entire background is in complete blackness. Okay. And we have some very heavy shadows down in the lower areas as well. So we have a very centralized uh, uh, composition. All right. And uh, in particular, I want you to notice how their gaze does not come anywhere near the uh, the theme of this image. Okay, it's it's as if they don't want to dwell on the uh, uh, horrific act that they just they they just did. Okay, so it's it's a very compelling storytelling. Uh, uh, element with this particular image. Okay. So these are examples of, of tenebrism. Now let's get a little bit into the more familiar realm of chiaroscuro. All right. Chiaroscuro, uh, we think of again, like past masters, but it's still very much alive and well. Uh, this particular artist, Simon Beasley, uh, is a phenomenal comic book artist. And he undertook a personal project of illustrating the Bible. If you've ever seen, you know, past master's illustrations of the Bible, like Albrecht Dreuer, uh, they made these, these fantastic etched images that illustrated the, the older Bibles. What he wanted to do was he wanted to give a more modern convention to the illustrations. And he underwent a, a personal project of kind of modernizing the illustrations of the Bible. Uh, personal project, I don't think he ever completed it, uh, but he did put out a book uh, with a lot of the concept sketches and some of the finished work, including uh, including this piece here, which he rendered in oil. But you can see how heavy shadows influence the space. And if you'll notice that the shadow has detail in this particular case. It hasn't quite overwhelmed the entire space, leaving you to guess how deep the space is. We actually see the extent of the room that this this character is in down here, okay? <clears throat> and of course, we have a single point light, which is illuminating this whole scene, which is very, uh, it's a classical um, lighting technique for a lot of the, uh, this period, this time period of uh, illustration, of uh, painting. All right, so chiaroscuro is defined by use of strong contrast. But if you notice, especially with the next few samples, is that the contrast doesn't go to complete black. And of course, uh, one of the, uh, or, well, in this case, you can see that there is a, a balance between areas of brightness and areas of darkness, volume-wise, okay? But we have a lot of shadow, but we also see some detail going on uh, within this shadow area, not only here, but also, uh, you know, uh, detail going on here, okay? One of the uh, more prolific painters 
of course, was Rembrandt. Uh, I'm sure. I'm sure no photographer ever has ever studied lighting and not heard the name Rembrandt. We've labeled a lighting style, a lighting technique after this famous artist. We have Rembrandt lighting in portraiture. And Rembrandt lighting uses that heavy contrast of shadow and light. It goes a little bit more nuanced with that, you know, uh, triangle underneath the eye uh, on the cheek, uh, you know, to kind of clarify it from other types. But in essence, it's that heavy shadow to light ratio, but not so much that the shadow goes to black. We can see spots of the sky peeking through the trees here. We can see detail of the carriage. Uh, we can see the, the, the character there. Um, we do have some areas that go into complete black. But if you compare this to the previous tenebrism, uh, uh, we are introducing a lot more light into the scene. Okay, our light source is becoming a lot more evident uh, and a lot larger uh, in this case. Uh, they are not these, you know, the candle or the torch. All right. In this case, we actually have uh, light coming in from uh, the sun. Maybe it's a setting sun uh, or maybe it's even early morning and the sun is just coming up and just washing across these characters. All right. Here's another one by Rembrandt, another great use of uh, heavy shadow, especially in the area above and behind our group. And if you notice, we, we kind of have three levels of lighting going on. We have our main characters, uh, this captain, uh, apparently very famous, I, I don't remember the full details of it. Uh, him and his cohort are very well lit. So that's uh, the first layer. Then we have, oh, then we have our, come on. Why isn't this working now? Oh, I know why. There we go. We have this second layer behind with all these people that are lit all right you can you can argue that they are lit but they are not as brightly lit as the foreground characters and then of course we have uh the space that these people are in the characters are in this massive uh uh either a building or uh an auditorium or some kind of public space and you can you can see that the further back we go, the darker it gets. So Rembrandt's using light to give us a sense of depth, not only uh, standing the characters off from that background row of people, but also taking that row of people and separating them from, you know, within that space. Uh, so chiaroscuro doesn't render the shadow as complete black. There is a lot of detail. You, oh, you guys probably can't even see it, but there is. Ah, oh, come on. I keep hitting the button. There, yeah, that's it. <laughs> My mouse doesn't want to behave. There's a lot of, uh, um, what you call it? Uh, shadow detail in here. You're probably not seeing it, but if you were to actually look at this uh, image, uh, you would you would uh, really see the difference, okay? Um, actually, this particular image is located at the Fairfield University uh, Art Gallery. So you can actually go to the museum and view this particular piece. 
which is pretty cool. Then we get into something that might be a little bit more familiar for you guys, especially if you're an old movie buff like I am, and that is noir or uh, more particularly film noir. Film noir is a uh, um, aesthetic that was used uh, at the height. It was around the 40s and 50s. And um, it was a heavy use of light and shadow to really create atmosphere, uh, not necessarily to direct the viewer's eye to the, uh, the main subject, because with film, we're talking about moving picture. We have dialogue and we have character movement to kind of aid within that. But the lighting was used to create atmosphere for these characters to play in. Okay. And we do still see a lot of the film noir influence in some of our movies nowadays. All right. And... Film noir uh, came about from the early German Expressionist movement. Uh, and, of course, the, the classic Metropolis, the movie Metropolis, kind of uh, set the tone for that. Uh, and let me tell you, guys, if you've never watched some of the old German Expressionist movement uh, movies... Do yourself a favor. It's a huge treat. Look them up. There are a lot of them are available on YouTube. Uh, and uh, some are dubbed. Uh, most of them are uh, silent, obviously. It's, they're from the silent era. But they, they got the um, the little cards that, that have the dialogue. A lot of them have been translated into the English. So you can kind of follow along with the story as well. Uh, the Closet of Dr. Moreau is is a a classic. You got to watch. Uh, hey, yeah. Is uh, graininess a part of noir? Graininess? No, it's not. Uh, uh, noir refers to the use of the light. That graininess was. It's just because the film. It, it was a byproduct of the technology. Uh, not necessarily an aesthetic choice. So, but if you if you were to have watched some of these, there's very little noise in a lot of those old movies. All right, um, you know, uh, well, depends. If if you go back to you know the 1920s, like this particular uh, film, uh, there's there's a lot of um, there's a lot of noise from the damage that the film received, because uh, obviously a lot of these films, the, a lot of the originals were lost, so they had to kind of replicate it from the copies that were made for distribution. So a lot of those get beat up, they get stored, they get you know uh, chewed up, um, run through projector night after night after night, puts a wear and tear on them. So that kind of noise was just from use. And because we don't have the masters anymore, that kind of traveled along with it. Uh, and over time, we've kind of come to accept it as, as the norm for these old movies. But it wasn't at the time. It's just something that we've come to accept. And... Uh, it has endeared us to some of these old movies because of the, you know, uh, the imperfections in the film. Um, but, but overall, that grain is just a byproduct of technology. Uh, what you're looking for is that interplay of light and dark. Okay. Now, modern photographers do introduce noise as as another level to it. Uh, it. It's just another way of adding a little bit of texture to the image, but it's not necessarily uh, a, a requirement. Okay. Case in point, 
one of my all-time favorite films, Casablanca. I can watch this film over and over uh, many, many times and not get bored of it. Uh, 1942. Uh, this was right at pretty much the height of the film noir movement. Uh, just think of movies like the Maltese Fal Falcon, uh, any Hitchcock film. <laughs> um, you know, they look. I want you to look at this right here. OK. That little bit of light does absolutely nothing to draw attention to the characters. But it adds so much texture to an otherwise bland, blank wall. That's, it's genius. And that was probably done with a gobo. Uh, a gobo uh, or a kukuloris is what goes between the light and the... Um, the surface the light is striking. Uh, so, uh, you know, we have, all right, there's, there's a term for this right here uh, in film, and it's called a practical light. A practical light is a light that you see in a scene that, you know, if a character turns it on, the, the light goes on in the room. But Doug, if we, yeah, you're in front of whatever you circled. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I am. Uh, if you look at that light and what it's illuminating, it's behind our characters here. These two characters are in front of that light. They would not be lit by that light, but yet they're very well lit. Okay. Actually, if you look at it, you can say, well, you know, maybe it's another light just like it off to the side. But if you look at our heroine here, she's not lit on this side. She's lit from within. All right. So our source of light for this scene is not here. It's elsewhere. All right. It's probably a little bit above them uh, shining down. All right, that light source is probably. Oh, uh, let's go back. Duck. In other words, right here. Duck. Yeah. In other words, rules like you uh, don't want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me rephrase this. In other words, the rules for photography, where we've been taught, the light in your eye automatically goes to the lightest thing in the picture doesn't apply to film because other things are going on like you said dialogue and, and whatever yeah but you also have to understand that that principle of our our eye going to a lightest part of the image is only one small part of a group of of rules okay our eye goes to people all right. And in particular, people's faces. And even more particular, people's eyes. So if there's an eye uh, within the scene, the first thing you're going to go to is, oh, I did it again. Can't get my, my drawing here. Right here, right here. Okay. Those are the first two characters your eye goes to because they're facing us, okay? Then we go over here, okay? Now, mind you, this is just a still of, of a scene, all right? But this is brilliant as, as a still because he's looking at Rick. He's looking at Rick. Rick is looking at uh, Elsa. El Elsa? Elsie? I can't even remember her name. Um, all right, who's returning the gaze, okay? So we have this very circular composition, all right? And it's enhanced by that circle of light right in here, okay? So even though we have this very bright source of light up in the corner, we have to understand that, you know, in the context of things as a moving picture, 
we are following not only the dialogue, but the movements of the actor, which are going to influence where we look. All right. So uh, as a still, even though this light is the brightest source, okay, the fact that we have people uh, within the scene, they kind of um, hijack our view, right? And we very quickly dismiss that light, okay? We dismiss it uh, because there's more important things for us to look at, okay? And and that's these characters, okay? I'll, I'll follow up question, Doc. Yep. So if I'm doing event photography, let's say I'm in a room like this and I have three people, they're doing something, whatever, and I have a light to the right like that, should mm -hmm. I not be concerned that the light is that bright? Great question. I would say be concerned because obviously you need to understand uh, how the light is interplayed with your scene. But realize that you can control that in post-processing as well. Uh, as you know, I do event photography as well. A lot of, you know, ribbon cuttings and, and open houses and things like that. And what I do is I, I use a flash. So oftentimes if somebody is in, in front and I'm, uh, and, and I'm photographing uh, somebody further away, this person is going to be very well lit. And so in post-processing, I will tone them down by a stop, stop and a half, sometimes even two stops, in order to push the light more towards my subject and less from that, that you know, you know, people get in the way. We can't help it, all right? Uh, so rather than having a very annoying bright corner or bright edge, I'll burn it down in order to shift the light source somewhere else. All right. So you do have to be cognitive of what your light source is, where it's coming from, you know, direction and all that. But if you can position yourself in a way that it kind of, uh, puts that very bright spot out of frame, that'd be great. If you can't, if if you're stuck with it, then at least, you know, in post-production, understand that you can do certain things to further manipulate the light in your favor, All right? So hopefully that answers uh, your question there. Yes. Uh, and, and it's definitely, you know, uh, you're going to judge that every time you come across it. Every time you got to make that decision. And, you know, sometimes you got to do what you got to do. Oftentimes I'll take the shot just so I have the shot. And then if I still have a little bit of time to play, I'll jockey myself into a better position. All right. But sometimes that shot is the only shot you get. That's it. Moment's gone. You 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 got it and and you hope for the best. So, uh, but if you have the ability, all right. If you're like a studio photographer and you have the ability to manipulate your light within the scene, taking a look at these examples of how these masters have lit their scenes will help. Uh, you know, kind of. Uh, um, leads you in a direction uh, where you can really understand your own lighting situation a lot better. Okay. All right. Another one of my favorite movies, Blade Runner. Um, <clears throat> Blade Runner used the film noir aesthetics, right? Heavy use of light and shadow uh, to kind of like represent this dystopian future. Okay, and you can see that the brightest point of light is on Rachel's face. 
everything else, all right, it's it's well lit back there. You can tell, you know, you can you can see the expanse of the room. We have shadow detail uh, in these areas here along the floor, oh, uh, up in up in the corners here. Okay, we have a lot of shadow detail, but all the light in this case is framing our subject, which is very dark. Okay, so we have we have a dark subject on a light field. All right, which is you know uh, again one of those rules uh, where you know our eye is going to go to the brightest area. Okay, and because the brightest area is pretty much the entire frame, we're going to separate our subject, which is darker, and focus in on that. All right, so it's kind of like a reverse. Okay. And then, of course, uh, you know, I uh, can't believe this movie is this old already. Uh, 2005, Sin City. Robert Rodriguez turned Frank Miller's acclaimed graphic novel into a movie that replicated Frank Miller's style of using bold black and white uh, to illustrate the, the comic book. Okay, And in this case, Robert Rodriguez not only relied on lighting, but a few other clever little tricks of painting certain elements uh, uh, white on the character, white props to help reflect some of that light, uh, things like that. Uh, like for example, uh, the the glasses that one of the characters wears, okay, is rendered completely white. Uh, it's it helped mimic the comic book, but light was used to help render those glasses as pure white. And in this case, what what he did was he really amplified the contrast, all right, to the point where you have to rely on shape to really uh, illustrate what it is that the person is looking at, okay? All right, uh, and then uh, this one here is not a photograph or anything, but it's an illustration uh, by Bernie Wrightson that utilizes uh, that film noir style, right? Except he rendered it in pen and ink, where he's bringing light to our main characters and throwing the just enough information in the background to give us a hint. Oh, give us a hint of our location, all right, uh, to kind of help tell the story, okay? And this is very typical of that film noir style, all right? Uh, if you look at a lot of the film noir movies, um, the sets were very simple. There wasn't a lot going on in the background, just enough to kind of help move the story forward. All right, and then now the last part, uh, is low key, uh, what we term low key photography. And I chose this particular example because this is something that, uh, you see a lot of when describing low key is where that, that light is used to kind of like just kiss the edge to give a little bit of definition to the form. And if we look at this and compare it to our previous examples, you can see how much those, the tenebrism, the chiaroscuro, and the film noir has influenced this style of photography. And what we're utilizing here is, you know, the heavy use of black, uh, the, the use of uh, shadow to give some kind of, of uh, volumetric uh, feel to the subject, okay? Here's one uh, from Sally Mann. 
where uh, all the light is literally on our main subject. And uh, we see a little bit of a bright spot up there. And to be honest, had this been my image, I probably would have toned that down a little bit more uh, than, than what it is. But hey, I'm not Sally Man. Okay. But you can see, you know, obviously uh, we have a lot of brightness on the face. Uh, we also have, you know, the, the whiteness of the clothing that kind of helps uh, accentuate this. Um, and of course, we have that bright spot of the, the candy cigarette that just really just adds to the whole entire mood of the image. But everything in the back is all shadow, all shadow. All right. And all that shadow is just making us look into the image. OK. This one is friggin' phenomenal. I wish I could do this photograph. Um, uh, I'm sure this is probably uh, uh, you can tell it was a, a longer exposure uh, because if you look at this character shifted ever so slightly, but we have a column of people here and a column of people here and a column of people here that are just moving through. So you can tell that this was a, a you know, definitely a long exposure. But you can see the distinct use of light uh, coming through the windows that is rendering everything else into shadow. Okay. And uh, for this, you really need to understand exposure and how to balance your exposure in order to get, you know, uh, uh, these bright areas that are not grossly blown out. All right. We can see detail through those light streaks. We can see the, the brickwork behind there. All right. So those light streaks are not completely blown out. Uh, yeah, we do have a lot of blowout up here, but that's that's to be, you know, accepted. Okay. However, that brightness is causing uh, all these areas here to really go into shadow, especially back there uh, behind this the the stream of light. Okay. But we don't have such deep shadow that it kills the space. We get a sense of volume uh, with the use of the shadow in, in this particular case. Uh, it's looking at this image, you can, you can feel how cavernous Grand Central Station really is. Uh, as compared to, you know, an image that is, you know, well lit and you can see all the detail. Uh, that kind of image would really shrink the space down even more. Okay. And of course, uh, Annie Leibowitz. She's a master at controlling light. And we can see how this, she's just basically using window light to illuminate the uh, the queen, and to be honest, knowing that it's an Annie Leibovitz image, I don't think she left it to chance that that's natural light. All right, I don't know too much about the behind the scenes to uh, of this particular image, but I would get venture a guess that right over behind over here somewhere, she has a light. I can I can almost uh, bet money on it, but this is uh, another great use of light and shadow. All right, again, the shadow is not so deep that we lose our sense of space. We can see a lot of the detail of this very fancy room that the queen is sitting in. All right, but the shadow sets that mood. It's a very somber almost solitary uh, uh, feel uh, to this portrait, 
you know, uh, and and I'm sure there are times where she feels like this, where she is the only one in the world. Uh, you know, I won't want to, I would not want her job, that's for sure. You know, but it's a very solitary looking uh, or feeling uh, portrait, very powerful. Again, using that um, uh, that very deep shadow. Uh, and very bright highlights uh, with with the, that really just delicate balance between the two of them. Okay. Anyhow, that is my little presentation. I wanted to give you an in this, uh, insider look into some of the terminology and the differences between uh, tenebrism, chiaroscuro, obviously film noir, uh, borrows from it, and uh, uh, low key photography borrows from it. Okay. All right. <clears throat> let me, uh, let me just go to the chat. Any questions on that little presentation? Hopefully you learned something. I, I don't have a question, but I have something to point out if anyone's interested, cause I'm, I'm immensely interested in, uh, Frank Miller's work. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I love Marv. <laughs> yes. So that, and, and so far, I couldn't figure out how to get one up to show you, but there's an app out there called Camart, C-A-M-A-R-T. Okay. And they have a Marv filter. <laughs> <laughs> so you just, it is pretty interesting. Cool. Yeah, and I bet you it doesn't work all the time, though, because it requires a very specific use of light. Yeah. Well, it, it, it has its fun with it, but... Yeah, and, and on that thing, I remember hearing a uh, an interview with Robert Rodriguez that uh, what he did to come up with to be able to do those colors, be, or you know that that effect, because Frank Miller had been waiting for years and years and years, and no one could figure out how to do it, which is why that movie didn't get made until it did. Yeah, so, interesting. Yeah, and you know it, it's it's fascinating. The other thing I I want you guys to to take away from this is pay attention to oil paintings, pay attention to film. You know, uh, we're photographers, so by nature we kind of just want to look at other photographs to get inspiration. But there's a lot to be learned from past masters like Rembrandt. Uh, you know, especially the Dutch masters, they were fantastic at painting those those little kind of like islands of light, you know, from that one candle. All right. And, and if you've ever tried to photograph a, a scene with just one candle, it doesn't quite work that way. All right. One single candle is not going to light up a scene the way these masters were representing it. Okay. So it's not like they were painting from life, from what they saw. They were expanding on it. They were painting their own vision of the light. All right. And you got to understand this is in the 17th century. All right. Mid, mid uh, 1600s. Uh, to to uh, early 1700s, there were no photographic techniques to inform their painting. Everything came from their their head, their mind, from what they saw. They took it and they elevated it to a new level, you know. And we can use that kind of inspiration for our own. And in particular. Uh, I, I want you to consider it when you are editing your images. A lot of times, you know, I, I hear from so many people that said, well, you know, that's just the way the camera caught it. So that's the way I'm going to present it. OK, well, sure. If you want to be a purist like that, who am I to tell you no? However, if your goal is to instill more mood into your image, more feeling into your image, you need to apply certain psychological changes into your images 
in order to boost those feelings. And the use of light and shadow is probably one of the easiest ways of doing it. Because we can dodge and burn uh, right within Photoshop and, and Lightroom to enhance our images ever so much more powerful than just straight out of camera. So do consider that. Okay. All right. So anyhow, thank you for uh, uh, listening to my little uh, demonstration. If you like these kind of things, let me know. Um, I'm always looking to, you know, go beyond the shutter speed and the aperture setting and the, you know, so. Doug? Yo. On the opposite end of that, why would you use high key in portrait photography? Where I, I, I'm guessing now it's, and I, I don't know this, I'm guessing high key is where you have the background being hotter and light. Okay. Yeah. So, so the difference between low key and high key is where you place uh, your light values. For low key, uh, which is the examples that I showed you, you'll notice that the, if you were to look at at the uh, histogram of a lot of those images, you're going to see a lot of those uh, histograms go towards the uh, uh, the shadow side, okay, with very little in the highlight side. High key is just the opposite, where you're going to get more uh, more light or, or more data in the light side of the histogram than in the dark side. And I've talked to you guys before about that middle gray, and that it tends to be the definitive mark. Low key tends to be to the right or to the um, uh, left hand side as you're looking at the at the, at the histogram. Uh, low key tends to be more towards the left hand side to the dark side of that middle gray, while high key tends to be more towards the right side. Right. That doesn't mean that you're not going to have any data in those parts. All right. Because you can have. Like, for example, uh, a model with dark complexion against a very light background, okay? And you're going to see the majority of the histogram is going to be in the lights, but there's going to be that little bit of a spike in the shadows. That's your subject, okay? So, but that middle point, that 50% uh, percent gray, that tends to be the demarcation between what what is a high key and what is a low key. Okay. Uh, what was the other part of that? Why Question? would you use it for portrait photography? Oh, let okay. Me, well, uh, let me let me tell you the situation. Yeah. I uh, once to when I worked at JC Petty Portraits one year, I uh, worked with a guy, uh, a black guy who did photography on his own doing families and stuff, but everything was a high key where the background was really bright. Did he, and they were all, he did, his clients were all black people. And did he do that to show a separation between the people and, and the background where it might be different with a, uh, a light skinned person with a background? Absolutely. Uh, let me see if I can find what I did with all right uh, I don't know if I have um... I don't know what I what I did with that illustration from oh I know where hold on give me one second let me let me uh, look something up real quick um workshops uh were you present when i did my my talk on the three tone um yes three tone yes. guide to composition yes okay all right 
<clears throat> Let me pull up that. I'll pull, I'll pull up the more complex one here. All right, and uh, let me go to desktop. Okay. All right, so, so this uh, is an illustration I put together um, that kind of just breaks down uh, using three tones, the various uh, um, mixes that you can use uh, using, you know, sticking to just kind of like three tones, okay? And if you notice, if you have, uh, well, let's just, if you have a dark person wearing dark clothing on a dark background, all right, it's going to have a significantly different look than if you put that same person on a light background. All right. And what we're looking at is the contrast between foreground and background. Okay. Putting a dark complexion on a light background increases that contrast as compared to uh, putting a dark complexion against a dark background where there's little to no contrast. So is one better than the other? Mm, yes and no. Putting them with a high contrast makes it easier to read what the subject is because you can see uh, the, the boundaries. You can see the silhouette of the person, all right? We can we can distinct distinctly see what the shape is that we're looking at. Whereas if we are putting them on a low contrast background, those edges get kind of muddled, all right? So we need to be a lot more creative and clever with our lighting in order to inform the viewer what it is that they are looking at. All right. Uh, and it works the same way in reverse. You know, take a very light person and put them on a light background. Uh, we're going to have a very low contrast scene. Okay. So what we want to do is we want to control certain elements of, uh, for example, a high key scene, all right, and maybe push them closer to this level, all right. Uh, not so much that they're they're going to be so dark uh, within the frame, but you know maybe uh, or maybe even this, okay. Uh, I just don't have one. So just imagine, imagine this being darker. All right. All right. But we have here that 50% gray or lower going on. And that's going to make it a high key as compared to something maybe even like this, which is 50% and higher, which makes it a low key image. All right. So it all depends on, on the look that you want. Uh, not necessarily one is better than the other, but they both give two completely different looks. Something that has a very bright background is going to have a different feel than a dark background. Dark backgrounds tend to be a lot moodier. Uh, more mysterious, uh, maybe a little bit more somber, while a bright background uh, will be, you know, a little bit uh, uh, happier, um, a little bit more vibrant, uh, definitely less spooky, less mysterious, uh, because everything's pretty much out in the open. Uh, it tends to have more of a 
a spiritual feel, right? Um, so there's there's a lot of reasons to choose one over the other, uh, and not necessarily just what the subject matter is. Okay. Hopefully that illustrated. Thank you. Thank you. So, but great question, great question. Um, <clears throat> Anybody else got any questions? Uh, we can even talk about something not related to the presentation. I have a real simple question. And this is beginner stuff, but I, and I forgot how to do it, or maybe I never knew how to do it. I want to make, uh, I was playing around with another template. This was a book cover template. You know, and, and so what I need to do, there's a spine and I need to be able to have the text go, not vertical, but, you know, flip it sideways so it goes up and down, but it's still looking like the spine of a book. Make sense? Yeah. Uh, so you can rotate the text. Just rotate the text. Is that what that is? Okay, rotate the text. All right. Yeah. Yeah, all you're going to do is rotate it 90 degrees. Uh, all right. You know, depending on what what uh, what what uh, orientation you want, whether you're going to read it this way or whether you're going to read it this way. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I was I was trying to figure that out at one thirty in the morning the other day, and I just. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, just simply rotate the text, uh, uh, and it'll it'll still be live text. So. Uh, and, and going back to your other presentation, this doesn't really. This has. Well, I suspect that you and I would spend hours and hours and hours enjoying the same movies. Because one of the things I always remembered about things like Casablanca and a lot of those movies is just how crisp black and white can be. Yeah. You know, compared to some of the washed out pictures of the 50s that weren't Technicolor. Mm hmm. But then the other thing I was going to point out to the folks here, if you, if you want to see a real interesting study in how black and white is used in a film, The Last Picture Show. Yes. He uses all sorts of different lighting, black and white techniques, you know, and I, back then I was in my black and white dark room, you know, and I go, oh, he's got number four triax with this, you know, or he used, you know, those kinds of things to uh, set a different mood for whatever he yeah. was doing in the movie. Pretty remarkable. Yep, yep. It's a it's amazing what uh, could be done just with chemical processing alone uh, to film stock. You know, uh, I'm spoiled by digital manipulation. You know, because I I'm able to do a lot more than I ever could in my little basement dark room back back in the day. You know, uh, of course I didn't have the knowledge needed back in the day to be able to do a lot of fancy stuff with chemicals. But, you know, uh, yeah, I, I don't think I'd trade it for the world what I can do digitally nowadays. If you want to, if you want to look at a TV, you know, a TV series from the sixties and see, you know, uh, TV was black and white then it changed to color. There were some shows that had been in black and white for a few years and then color, uh, it was bad for the fugitive. The fugitive. Oh yes. Because the thing is, the show was dramatic. I mean, here's this guy out of the mud, and he's looking over his shoulder every two seconds, and you could you could see the texture of the the you know the darkness of it. Whereas once it went to color, and now the TV networks were it was, like, yeah, the TV networks were like, you know, everybody's buying a color set. And that last year just looked awful. It, it lost its it's lost its push. Uh, the other thing that happened with that series is they changed producers, and there were some uh, problems. With yeah, things. but they, they, actually, you know, you you brought up an interesting uh, point there. If you do compare uh, the black and white movies, and then when color started coming about. You'll notice that the the color films were a lot flatter. Yes. You know they they especially you know uh, uh, made for television they were very flat looking there was like no depth to them. 
You know, you you saw that still shot from Casablanca. That little, just one frame, you can see the depth of that whole entire scene going way, way in the background. Uh, and the, the once color got introduced, we lost that depth for some reason. You know, it was, but yeah, that's a good, great point. Another TV show, um, Perry Mason was on for, for nine years. I mean, that had a very uh, film noir, especially the first season. And then as time went on, they sort of modernized it. And yeah. It sort of looked like any other show in the 60s. And then there was one episode they did in color, and it comes up on me TV once in a while. It just looks, it looks out of place. Yeah. It, look, it looked as if it was a uh, pilot for. The next season he did, which was, uh, what do you call it, uh, Ironside. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, obviously I don't have to tell you guys, you know, there's there's a lot of lessons to be learned in, in all those old movies, you know. So what we need to do is just kind of like look at some of those old movies with a different set of eyes now and just think, how can I utilize those techniques you know, how can I manipulate the light on my images? You know, whether it's it's controlling where the eye goes or just adding texture and mood. The one thing that was, did you ever see the TV show Suits? No. Okay. Uh, it's about lawyers, but they did a lot of scenes where the lawyers are sitting or standing next to a window and you see the actors being dark and you see the bright light in the background. I, they must have been communicating something that way. Uh, with how they wanted to shoot with a lot of bright light in the background from 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 office light and, mm -hmm. and the and the characters are, are dark in front of that because of that. Yeah, that again. That's you know a style choice too, um, but uh, without really knowing the scene, I, I I can't really put my two cents into that one. <laughs> I, I guess you have to know. I guess you yeah. have to know the show to handle it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's where Meghan Markle came from. Yes, yes. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Cool. All right, guys. Uh, if there are no further questions, we can call it quits here. Uh, again, thank you, everybody, for uh, spending this evening with me. Hopefully, uh, you learned a little something with this presentation. Um, I uh, dig into my little archives and pull out little tidbits every so often. Um, if you like the idea of analyzing past masters, uh, I can go into a little bit more detail. Um, that would be that would be good because I feel you know, uh, and, and Joe will probably agree with me on this. There's a guy in North Haven who is a trained artist, and his background is art, and he teaches art, and he comes from an art background. And every time I hear a lecture like the one you just did, or the one that he does, or somebody else would do, I feel that I am missing something by not having an art background. Uh, you know, I have I have that art background, and uh, I can speak from experience that there is so much of that world that influences my photography that it's not even funny. Uh, not just not just in the editing part, but in the field work, the composition. Um, I'm by no means a master at composition, you know, uh, I, I, I'm not. But when I when I stop and think about how I compose a certain frame, uh, you know, especially doing events, uh, you can see that I'm, I'm pulling from this resource without even really thinking about it. 
All right. Like, for example, I just recently did a, um, uh, a ribbon cutting. Uh, let me see if I can pull up some images real quick. Uh, just did the, a ribbon cutting and, um, oh yeah, I don't have them here. Uh, and, and just the way I framed some of the group around the main speaker, uh, uh, borrows very heavily from the compositional rules that I went over here, where the eye is directing the viewer straight into the main subject, right? And I specifically look for moments like that uh, before I, I, I click the shutter, all right? Um, I also look for those key moments where there's action going on in those people that are just standing on the outside, all right? Uh, how many pictures have you taken where people are just kind of like, all right? And then uh, the the whoever finishes talking and then they all break into into a clap. That's when I take my photos because there's action going on everywhere within that scene. There's a little bit more animation than just people like uh, I'm listening, you know. Um, so. It's those little things that you really don't think about that really inform how you create your composition and when you take when you press the shutter. Absolutely. Yeah. When you talk about uh, opportunities or, or something that happens, I think the most dramatic uh, news photo, one of the most dramatic news photos of the 60s was that shot aboard Air Force One when uh, Lyndon Johnson took the oath of office mm. president right after uh, the murder of, of, of Kennedy. Uh, assassination yeah. of John Kennedy. There's John Kennedy's widow with, with a bloody dress still uh, next to uh, uh, then President Johnson and, and, and Lady Bird Johnson and the, uh, the judge uh, uh, giving an oath of office on the Air Force One. Yeah. Uh, extremely dramatic. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, there's there's a uh, big sense of luck in there. You know, uh, luck plays a an important role. You just being at the right moment at the right time. But that that moment of luck would be gone just like that if you weren't trained enough to recognize those moments. And that's where, you know, being able to see that moment, you know, really pays off as a photographer. Anticipating what uh, uh, Brisson calls the decisive moment. Anticipating that critical shot that is going to just speak volumes about that scene. Absolutely. And unlike today, you couldn't have a lot of cameras uh, never mind the cell phone cameras. You could have a lot of cameras and wireless and whatever. TV was film and it took forever to get it developed. And all you had was this one photographer mm -hmm. uh, on the plane. And that that told the story. That yeah. that one picture told the story to the United States, what was going and the world, what was going on. And, and all he had was the motor drive. He didn't have he didn't have digital film with me. That's right. it. All That's you, it. All you have is motor drive. <laughs> yeah, and it's funny if you were to if you were to look at his contact sheet, you probably only uh, he caught that probably within two or three frames. Mm -hmm. You know, not not fifty or sixty. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I remember, I remember. Uh, oh, many years ago. Uh, we did a field trip to the Bronx Zoo. Uh, you know, I, I had a bunch of photographers that, that you know, we, we traveled down to Bronx Zoo and we spent the entire day just all over the zoo. And we were over by the gorillas. And I had just gone finish explaining how, how to be able to shoot them through the glass and all that. And, uh, you know, all of a sudden, I, out of the corner of my eye, I watched somebody come in. wasn't part of our group. Behind me, I hear, Brrr, 
And then I see him walk out. And I'm thinking to myself, what did you just capture? What really did you just capture? All right. You walked in, you you barely acknowledged the, the space, the, the the subject. You fired off, you know, a dozen shots in quick machine gun succession. They were they're all gonna look exactly the same. Nothing has changed within those twelve shots, and he walked off. I can't believe it. But it was a great lesson for, for my students that were there. <laughs> Folks, don't do what he just did. <laughs> I, I can't understand it. But yeah, it's it's studying your subject, anticipating the moment, and uh you know, being ready to press the shutter. That's that's very important. That's very important in, in any photography, you know, not just event photography, but any photography. Okay. Uh so um also Moving forward, I want to set up, I don't know how I'm going to do it yet, but, uh, you know, the state's opening up. Uh, I want to be able to get somebody in into the studio here with me. Uh, Brian, you said you wanted to work on something with light painting, you know. I want to get some, some of you guys in here with me for a live workshop that we'll just, you know, broadcast um, on one of these Monday night sessions. So uh, look forward to that. Seeing it's light out to 8.30, I can, I can do that. Uh, <laughs> what you're driving, my eyes aren't that good at night. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't blame you. All right. Well, again, thank you for spending the evening with me. Again, uh, also, if you can let your buddies know that... Uh, uh, we meet here on Monday nights to talk uh, about good stuff. Uh, do invite them in, you know. Uh, next week, I don't have anything planned next week. But uh, maybe maybe we'll do something. I don't know. So anyhow, uh, otherwise we'll see you uh, the beginning of next month for our Lightroom class. <laughs> All right, Brian, thanks. Thanks, Doug. Thank you, everybody. Have yourself a good night. Yeah. Thanks, Doug. Good night. Good night. Thank you for watching Learning Photography with Duck. Brought to you in association with Milford Photo, your local full service camera store. Located in downtown Milford, Connecticut. Milford Photo offers you a personalized shopping experience. From the latest camera gear to printing and framing services. And, of course, educational workshops to teach you the finer aspects of photography. Don't forget to tell them Duck sent you.